It's in the church for the space of two minutes. We don't like silence in Baptist churches. That means somebody's supposed to get up and say something whenever the lull comes over, the piano stops playing, and then people think something's supposed to happen, so they get quiet, and the preacher's not ready, but I am ready now. So anyway, I'm, I'm glad to see you in the Lord's house today. Uh, aren't you glad for the rain? And praise the Lord for that. It's, uh, uh, see, I was telling the, the uh, hills that uh, my phone told me that uh, the lowest chance of rain possibilities is 4 o'clock this afternoon, and it's 40-something percent. That's the lowest. How many of you remember when we couldn't possibly even reach 10% chance of rain for months and months? So, hey, showers of blessing. I think that the pastor might have put that in the songs today. <gasps> there is. Matt's going to lead us in that, so we all think about that. Lots of things to be thankful for. Uh, for those of us who believe the Bible... And believe in the sanctity of life. We are very thankful this week because of the overturning of our of uh, uh, some bad legislation that has allowed the uh, the killing of unborn children without any kind of regulation at all, really. Uh, and so we're grateful for that. We temper our our gratitude. We're not we don't temper our gratitude, but we can temper uh, we we uh, temper it with a, a, a spirit of realization that we haven't changed the culture mindset yet. We still live in a nation of a culture of death. We do. It is not important. Life's not important. And uh, we see that, of course, with the unborn. We also now see it with the elderly. We see it with the tremendous uh, lack of interdiction and the drug issues of our culture today and the thousands and hundreds of thousands that are losing their life to drug overdoses. Uh, we're seeing a very uh, a culture of death, really, in our culture, in, a, in our land, land. And we need to pray for that violence and that, uh, that spirit to be overcome by the love of Christ. And I'm hoping today that that will be something we focus on as we go forward. And so please remember that. Now, a couple things to tell you about. Uh, because of all the rain here and that we're going to be, you know, growing fins before. And so we have gotten our reservation back for Pine Flats. And we are going to meet at Pine Flats picnic area on July 4th. And starting at 10 o'clock, show up uh, for the uh, annual 4th of July picnic. Uh, 10 o'clock, we will have eating right around noon. Um, but uh, everything is back on and we're, we're good to go. And uh, it's a good place where we're at, close to the facilities that we need. And uh, of course, lots of things that can go on there. We're, we're wanting you to bring your side dishes and drinks, and you probably want to bring a kind of a camp chair, comfortable camp chair, bring that with you. And um, so uh, you can enjoy the things that are going on. We'll have the horseshoes and we'll have other activities and hikes and all sorts of stuff. But plan for that on the 4th of July. That's a week from tomorrow. And uh, maybe we'll get rained on up there. You say, oh, that would be terrible. No, don't ever do that. Say, go out and say, I, I can remember Bible school. We were in Bible school uh, last week, and I don't remember what day it was, but uh, Carl and I were in the back. And our ki my kids were in their craft, and so I was watching them a little bit and talking with Carl, and someone came in, it's raining outside. And we said, what? We immediately hurried, left all of our kids in the wilderness to go out to the, to the, uh, the, the oasis, and we went out the front door, and we looked up, and there were just these small little drops. But I lifted up my face. <laughs> I said, praise the Lord. Isn't it good to have the blessings of God? And it starts out small, but it got bigger during the, 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 the rest of that afternoon. Now, um, you say, why are you so excited? Because God's good. And uh, I'm thankful for the, all the rain. Now, if it rains on us up there, uh, just go home, okay? That's okay. You can just go home if that happens, or else you can just stay out there and enjoy it. But we are going to be up there and enjoying that. We appreciate the Sizemores have opened their house up to us, and they live in Sandia Park. But since this uh, opportunity to get this, the uh, uh, campsite came up, we grabbed it. So we're, we got it all reserved for you, a place for you can, to park and a place for you to come out. And uh, it's, it's handicap accessible pretty much. Um, and we'll help you if you want to come and just spend a little time. We'll eat about noon. We hang out in the afternoon until everyone's pretty tired, then we go home. So that's, that's what's going on for that and, and plan for that. 
Uh, I'll let Joe share some more of those announcements. Let me welcome folks here today. We're glad as we get ready to worship the Lord and have our our worship service now to have you in the service with us. We do want to remember folks that are away. Think of Angela Coletta. She's still uh, helping with her daughter up in Washington and the new baby. So continue to pray for them. In light of that, we have some folks from her former church, Desert Gateway Baptist Church. It's good to have Claire and Leonie and Joe. And I didn't get your daughter's name. Anna, okay. It's good to have you guys here in the service with us today. Lord bless you, and uh, we're glad to see you. And it is so good to see Carol and Robert here, and uh, uh, DW's grandson, Adrian. It is a nice to see you guys in the Lord's house today. God bless you. It's good to have you. And, and uh, anyway, it's, I haven't seen you in a while, but it's sure good to have you. And Mike in the back. And so Mike uh, has been here a time or two before, but uh, he evacuated from out up in uh, Trinidad area and uh, has come down here to, to wait till they get it all cleaned up. I think they're in the cleaning up process, and so he may be able to get back into his home up there uh, this week. So good to have you, Mike. Lord's blessing upon you. And all that are here today, we ask the Lord's blessing upon you. May God uh, encourage you. And so I'm going to have Joe come and share some of the other announcements, and uh, we'll begin our worship service then. All right, thank you, Joe. Good morning. Let's see some smiles. It's a beautiful day out there. The Lord gave it to you. Use it well. And we got some much needed rain. Amen. So let's smile. Everybody should be smiling about something today. Uh, Missionary of the Month, the Chadge Wells family. Remember them especially this month. And uh, Sunday quote, All the kingdoms built and trophies won will crumble to dust when it's all said and done. Just to remind you, the Lord is in control. And uh, when we think it's gloomiest, it tends to try us the most, but we come through it. And uh, I was going to announce the July picnic, but now we've, we've gone over that. Uh, so we will have that, but we'll have it in the forest. And July the 4th picnic, he's talked about. And July the 31st at 6 p.m., we will uh, have the Singspiration at this church. 6 p.m. We'll remind you before then so you remember. Let's smile. Come on. I want to see a smile. Come on. Come on. Come on. Smile. Uh, and in case you're interested, there will be no hot water in the old building for a few weeks as we replace the old water line. Uh, hopefully before too many Sundays go by. We have no birthdays and we have no anniversaries this week coming up, but we have a whole slew of them coming up next month and they're listed there. So have a great day, enjoy it, use it well, God bless and thank you. Well, Pastor, talking about the July 4th picnic, you forgot perhaps the most important thing that some of us need to bring. GPS trackers for the kids. There's a story there for the visitors. There's a story. You know, um, why did the um, why did the melons get married in a church? Because they can't elope. See, see, see that Joe. They were waiting for me to get up to smile, right? So. Let's let's stand and sing number 231. Blessed Redeemer 231. Up Calvary's mountain one dreadful morn walk Christ my savior weary and worn facing for sinners death on the cross that he might save them from endless loss blessed redeemer precious redeemer see now my soul him on calvary's tree wounded and bleeding for sinners bleeding blind and unheeding dying 
God, hold fast awaits, praying for sinners while in such woe. No one but Jesus ever loves so. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see. this morning comes from Deuteronomy chapter 26. I'll read a portion of this now and I will be explaining it a little further in the message. Verse 1 it says, And it came to be when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance and possessest it and dwellest therein that thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth which thou shalt bring of thy hand that the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall put it in a basket, and shall go unto the place which the Lord God shall choose to place his name there. And thou shalt go unto the priest, and say, shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, A Syrian ready to perish was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a nation, great, mighty, a populace. And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. And when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And he hath brought us unto this place and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee and unto thine house, thou and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you that you have brought us to this moment today. In this time, in this place, in uh, the land that you have brought us to, not the same way you did to your people in Israel, in Egypt, as you brought them out. But in the same way, Lord, you have determined that we be here at this time and place, in this land, under these laws, under these conditions. And you've been a mighty God to us, Lord. You have blessed us mightily. You've shown us truly your power and your terribleness and your signs and your wonders. You continue to do the mighty things, the acts that make you the one true God. You are God, there is none else. We come before you bowing today in this worship service 
in recognition that you are the God who's given us all things. As we present our tithes and offerings, it's a representative amount, we know. It represents our heart's desire to give you all that we are. We bless you today, Lord, for the God that you are to us, how you brought us out of the terrible bondage of sin and you placed us in Jesus Christ. And we're seated together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come, you might show the forth your kindness and your, your grace towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are we saved through faith that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So today, Father, we praise your name. Would you help your people? Would you bless us, Lord? Would you show us how valuable that we are to you today? May your praises resound in this place. May your word be proclaimed in its truth and righteousness. And may your people rejoice in you. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as promised, number 529, there shall be showers of blessing, 529. There shall be showers of blessing, this is the promise of God. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O oh Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. Come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. All right, it's time for our greeting chorus. It's Thank You, Lord, number 622. We will stand and sing this one time through and then have a time to greet one another before we come back and sing it again. 622. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. <clears throat> Tom, if you could lead us in prayer for the offering, please. Thank you. You may be seated. Hymn number 416, 416, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall Says, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. 
And then let's stand and sing number 514. He's a wonderful Savior to me. 514. I was lost in sin, but Jesus rescued me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was bound by fear, but Jesus set me free. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a friend so true, so patient and so kind. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Everything I need, in Him I always find. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Dearer, grow Jesus day by day. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Sweeter is His grace while pressing on my way. He's a wonderful Savior to me. For He's a wonderful Savior to me. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> girl is crying for affection. A little boy needs a hand to hold. And oh, how he loves those little children. How he longs to be a friend to young and old. His tender spirit welcomes all who seek him. His giving heart asks nothing in return. And I have found his promises faithful. I seek to live my life that I may learn. To like Jesus, to be like Jesus, to be the one I was created to be. Jesus, to be like Jesus. May all who see my heart by 
find him in me. When I received his salvation, his heavenly love filled my earthly soul, and I became his new creation. My brokenness he made completely whole, and through this darkness of this world I've been commissioned to be a light that shines for Him alone. Surrounded by His infinite mercy, may my life always be known to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, to be the one I was created to be. Jesus, to be like Jesus. My only earthly goal fulfilled when I'm centered in His will. May all who see my heart find him in me. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Beautiful song and a great message for us to be like our Lord Jesus Christ, the goal of every one of us to recognize our position in him. First uh, Peter, if you would please, first Peter chapter one, and we'll look at a little bit of chapter two, a couple spots for you today as we think about how important you are to God, how significant you are in his creation, and what a commission, as Matt sang about, he has given us to proclaim his word, his truth. And so we have uh, experienced a lot in the last couple years through the pandemic with uh, church ministries. Um, we've uh, pretty much, we were basically shut down entirely. Uh, we have some people who kind of knew how some of the computer stuff worked, and so they got me on Zoom and I didn't realize they made an entire Bible school curriculum out of the Zoom thing. We had Zoom, Zoom, Boomerang, Boomerang, Zoom, Zoom. I'm, that song was stuck in my head all week long. I think it's just getting out now. The end of the, you know, we finished last Sunday with our special closing and that Zoom, Zoom, Zoomerang song. Uh, but the one I've been thinking of is Building the Kingdom. That's stuck in my head now. So I got the second one going on about building the king and working for Jesus uh, working for the kingdom. So um, that's great that those songs stick in our mind. The, uh, the issue of, uh, of uh, ministry was greatly changed. Uh, I do recall the governor, and uh, please, when you watch her ads on TV, uh, please, uh, I know she's given you lots of money. Uh, I haven't gotten any yet. I don't know what happened to me. I, I guess I'm not, I'm not online enough. So I didn't, my daughter-in-law said, I, I looked at my account and there was $500 in there that shouldn't have been. So she started chasing it down. 
She, for me, I would have gone, praise the Lord, manna from heaven. She says, no, it's not supposed to be there. And she knows exactly what's supposed to be there and not. And I'm going, I don't know where it came from, but praise the Lord. I don't have that, you know, I don't have direct mail stuff, whatever it is. Anyway, so I'm still waiting on the governor's promise to help me out with the gas and stuff like that. But uh, maybe you've gotten yours and you're happy. But I remember her telling us changing the, the rules, uh, the, the state statute under, uh, 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 you know, emergency uh, orders, that the church was no longer part of what they considered essential business. She changed the law arbitrarily. She could do it, I guess. She just changed that and took churches out. Churches weren't important any longer a couple years ago. And not enough to stay open. So basically that allowed her to say what we could and couldn't do. Back in the back there, you can see exactly what our percentages of people book. I still have the uh, fire marshal certificate. He came over, he measured our building, and he said, now when we open back up, you can have X number of people. And I started to ask him about that. I said, what about the, you didn't measure up here for the choir. He says, oh, they're exempt. They can come. Oh, okay, good. That's half our church. That's good news. So I'm not so worried about the numbers. But boy, they were really concerned. So you read back there and how many we could have, like 17, 18, 20 people, depending on our square footage and how we figured it all out. And uh, we became unessential. I thought about that and I, a couple years ago, I did preach about the, the issue of the fact that the church is essential business. And I want today to talk to you about why the church is so important. I think we're seeing more and more that the government doesn't have the answer to our problems. In fact, what is it that Ronald Reagan says? They don't, they don't solve the problem. They are the problem. Uh, we could make that argument. But I, this isn't a political dialogue today. I'm not a PAC organization. I'm here to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus and his word. But what I do want to point out to you is that though the world, and we shouldn't be surprised, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And so understand that the world is not going to esteem your Savior highly. It is not going to look at the Bible as being inspired by God and important. They're going to shuffle these things off to the side. And realize there's millions of Christians in this country, so we got to put up with them, but we can marginalize them if we need to. And we will. And we are. And we'll find, quote, didn't the president just talk about the next pandemic that's coming? I don't know if he knows something I don't, but I don't know. There's, some, there's another pandemic coming that we need to prepare for. What that means is that the, the people in power have got to find a way in which they can uh, exert their power to minimize what's going on in the church. You say, they're not that. They're not that organized. No, they're not. But the prince of the power of the air is that organized. And he is the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. And if you're uh, uh, naive enough to not believe that Satan, who is this prince of power of the air, is, is not involved in the political aspirations of individuals and of countries and of, of, of the geopolitical process, then please, uh, you're missing uh, the whole issue of what he's doing down here. It's a bad place. It's a wicked place. This world, uh, the John says, it lies in the lap of the wicked one. He's controlling he controls the children of disobedience and through them he works his doctrine of devils, the scripture says. So he has a doctrine, he has a plan, he's got a, a purpose. His salvation is naturalistic saying don't trust in the God of the Bible, don't trust what those preachers say, don't believe in Jesus Christ. Instead, you just understand that you happened here by accident, an evolutionary process brought you here. We spent a week talking with the kids about why they are special a special creation of God. What a significant week that was in talking about it because this very week that followed Bible school, uh, the Supreme Court affirmed the fact that yes, unborn children are significant. They have rights. Uh, the right to end their life is not something that we can make a determination about. We'll send it back to the states and let them figure it out. Well, good. I, we, we've got a lot of work to do still on that. So the church is important. It is important to you, it's important to me, but it, more importantly, it's important to uh, the eternal plan of God. He created this thing called the church. 
body of Christ. And so I want to talk to you about why it's significant, why we need to honor it, why you are very special and a part of it. I've run across Christians from time to time. They'll say, I'm a Christian. You know, since I've been pastoring 40 some years, they'll say, I'm a Christian, but I don't, you know, I don't go to church much. Why? Oh, well, I just don't, you know, need it. It's kind of hard to do. And, you know, I, I just, me and the Lord, I, I talk to the Lord all the time. I pray, I read my Bible. I said, oh, that's good. But that's not what God created you for. He created you for a purpose of ministering with and for others. And you can't do that in isolation. There's no Lone Ranger guy. See, I, I get it. If there's someone's living on the way up in the, you know, I don't know, out back of Australia somewhere or in the, in the uh, Alaskan tundra someplace, uh, you and your family, you got to have your own church. Okay, I get it if that's where you are. But even that, and you talk to those people, there's something missing. So I, I, I'm curious about the, the, the thinking along that line because that is not a New Testament teaching and thought that you isolate yourself from other believers. In fact, the most important thing about the church is what it is, a body, a body of born again people. And so I wanna tell you that it's important, it's significant, and your part in it is essential. Now, we're not stopped from coming together now. You know, we, we can do what we want. We can fill the church up as much as we will. And uh, that's all open for us now. But the issue is, are the Holy Spirit filling us up so we can be to one another what the church is supposed to be? It's not this building. This building's got problems. It's falling apart. We're working on some of it. Talk to Brother Tom, Brother Carl. If you want to see a, a guided you know, tour of the problem, you can, to least to some extent. You'll be in a little closet and be looking down at a pipe. That's the extent of it. But there's far more underneath all of that that's uh, being in, in investigated. And so this building is not the church. This building is a building. We're thankful for it. It's great to have it. Aren't you glad we can have a little bit of air going so we can get the humidity? We're not used to that here. Our air conditioner won't work real well, our swamp coolers, because uh, humidity's high. But at least it'll you know, circulate a little bit. If it hits 90 degrees out there and you got you know, 70 something percent humidity, you're gonna be suffering. You're gonna be like Florida. We're not like that, but we're, uh, this building is a building. That's all. But you are important. I want to just show you how important you are to God. And it revolves around one particular word in 1 Peter. And we're going to look at that. But let's talk about this church. Look at verse 1 of chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto the lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now let me share with you that this portion of, of Peter here is a divine confession of what the church is all about. Peter, he understands this great essential unity, the church. The inception to the completion here you find in this first chapter. He hath begotten you to a lively living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the dead. If you're more concerned about what goes on before that, you look at verse 2 and you get worried about the things that there, according elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now you can divvy that out for yourself. 
the whole point is God's intensely involved in you. Before you or even you, he was concerned about you. He involved himself in your life. And then through the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace came unto you. You were saved. You were given a living hope by the resurrection. And you're giving an inheritance that is incorruptible. That's something that is awaiting for you, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith and a salvation. Guess how you're kept? You don't keep yourself saved. God says, I'm keeping you. He said, I initiated this plan of salvation long before you were even you, before you were formed in the womb. He said to, uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, not Nehemiah, who was it? Yeah, Jeremiah, one of those other prophet guys that slips my mind. Not really important at all, Jeremiah. That, that's a minor guy. <laughs> yeah, he said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and I ordained you uh, to be a prophet unto the people. Now that's interesting because Psalm 139 that the kids all learned about. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. So I will praise the Lord about that. God made me, and before there were any of my members, he knew me. I made a statement one time, before I ever was, God knew me. And I got a man who was in the service. He emailed me and he says, how could God know us before we were even formed? Where is that in the Bible? I made a statement. And so I went to Psalm 139 and I told him, it says, God says, before any of my numb members were created, he knew me. All of a sudden, I'm significant enough to God that he has them written, it says, in his book. He knows exactly. I don't know how that works out. Has he got a snapshot of me, a digital photo of what I'm going to look like? I mean, what age would he have taken it at? Is he like a a doting grandmother who has got the three-month picture, the four-month picture, the five-month picture, on it goes, doo -doo -doo -doo. and not only one, but multiples, so you can see them. It used to be that, you know, all you had to suffer through was a wallet, that the thing fell out, you know, and people would, you know, the little accordion wallet pictures, but now you go to their house, you say, oh, or the, you know, their phone, they can carry it with, hey, have you seen a picture of my little dear one here? Look at that. And you look at it, it says 687 pictures on this. So they start going through it, and you're going, you know, I really, I'm sorry, I got other things to have to do. But that is exactly what God is like. He says his thoughts to usward are more than can be reckoned up in order, Psalm 40 says. If I were to think of them, I can't count them. They're more than the sand of the sea, than the stars in heaven. God is thinking about you continually in this issue of, of your life, and where you intersect with his grace at the cross of Jesus Christ, God is making a divine confession about this salvation. This is all about me. I have planned it and says, you are created for my glory. That's what Ephesians 2, 5 says, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his goodness and his, his kindness and his grace towards us through Christ Jesus. God has put you on display he says, I saw you wretched in Egypt. And so the Jewish man was to come on the feast of first fruits and he was to bring his tithes. He was to bring his first fruit offering. It was symbolic in that basket. He held it there before the priest. The priest said to him, now I'll hear your confession. The Old Testament priests aren't quite like what we think about today as far as confessing. You're not confessing the wrong. You're confessing... I know who I am. I know where I came from. You have to give the history of God's blessing to you in your life and saying, you've brought me out to this land flowing with milk and honey. And now, Lord, I stand here confessing that I trust you. I believe in you. I followed you and I'm following your commands and I am bringing this as a token of the blessing. It's just a small amount of all the blessing you've given me. That's what it was. The divine confession is this issue of, of the church. Jesus said to Peter, uh, to the other disciples, but Peter answers, you know, who do uh, men say that I am? Well, you're one of the prophets, you're this, you're that. Uh, you know, John the Baptist. But who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter, the Lord says, Peter, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. 
And thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nothing's going to stop God's plan. The divine confession is clear, that salvation is available to any and all who will come to him. Whom having not seen, ye love. All of a sudden, there's millions of people who love Jesus Christ. They've never seen him. I'm skeptical when once somebody says, yeah, the Lord appeared to me. I had a vision and stuff like that. Okay. I, I see that that's how God spoke in times past. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 says, God spoken uh, to the fathers by the prophets through these signs and, and, and uh, dreams and so forth. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And so how did the, the Lord Jesus speak to us? Well, he told us in John that the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send you the comfort. I'm going away. But he's going to bring to remembrance everything I've said unto you. And so as Matt sang the song, to be like Jesus, how do we do that? Well, we look in the Bible because it reveals Jesus Christ. And you read about what he's like, and all of a sudden you recognize I'm not measuring up. I have to change. That's a confession. It is interesting that, that uh, the world doesn't understand the power. And that's exactly what he's saying here. Whom having not seen, you love. They have to see to believe. The Christian believes even if he hasn't seen because that's the power of what faith does. Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy and speak, oh, full of glory, receiving the end of your salvation. All the way to the end, God is working that plan. Now, coming to chapter 2 with me, I want to show you something else. The church is important because of the divine confession, but it's important also because you are its holy temple. You are the church. God has made church interdependent. And in chapter 2, you'll notice that Peter then pulls this idea together. In verse, uh, uh, in verse 1, he says, Having laid aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies, envies, all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone... He talked about that lively hope, living hope over in chapter 1, verse 3. You have a living hope, something that's alive. And now he calls you a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And his reference here is ultimately to the Old Testament references uh, in Psalm 118, in uh, Isaiah 28. Uh, there's some other places that speaks about this cornerstone. He says, you are a lively stone built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice is accepted to God by Jesus Christ. War for it is contained in scripture. Behold, I, I lay a sign, a chief's cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore, which believeth he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient whereunto also they were appointed. God made the church out of stones, living stones, you. It's not about the brick and mortar uh, and that covers the place. It's not about the old rusty pipes that the water flowed through which were changing. That's not the church. The church is an interdependent group of individuals. Each stone is connected to one another. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, when he starts talking, Paul starts talking about how significant this holy temple is, this group of people, Jew and Gentile, coming together. He broke down the middle wall of partition, the scripture says. We know what that was. That was that place that God, the holy of holy place, where only the priest could go once a year. We were separated from that. You couldn't get right into the direct access of God. And the writer of Hebrews says, now through the blood of Jesus, you have access to the holiest. You can go right there to God. And it's interesting that he says, he, and he came and preached peace to you, which were afar off. Before you were outside that hope. You were outside that help. You were aliens and strangers from the commonwealth of Israel is the way that, that Paul was putting it. But he says, now through him we both have access unto the Spirit, uh, by the one Spirit, unto the Father. You're now no more strangers and foreigners, but now fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation 
of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. You're the temple. You're the temple. And the temple is uh, not one stone can build it. It's thousands and millions. You know, I was thinking about the, uh, this cathedral of Notre Dame in, in Paris, France. Never been there. I saw pictures of it. Then I saw pictures of it burning, <clears throat> went up in smoke. And I remembered after that event that people started pouring money into it. And I, I understood, and I don't know if I'm absolutely correct about the price, but that they raised over $1 billion to reconstruct it. I said, a billion? Is that right? A billion? I hope I have that right. In my mind, I hear that they raised a billion, not million, B, billion dollars to reconstruct this cathedral. And I thought to myself, with all that money being directed toward that building, I mean, they must have just this dynamic, powerful, mighty, uh, Bible-based group of people proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you think that's the case? No. No, it's not. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were distressed to watch live through a website that connected us to our alma mater. We went to Tennessee Temple University College in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, I remember the, the, uh, the church, when I came from this little church, but before this building was built, we just had the small little mission building over there. And um, I went to the South to Bible college. And boy, it was a, quite a learning experience to go to, a, you know, the South is a different culture than what I was used to in the West. Really nice people, but they dressed up. I mean, went dressed up to go to church. Everyone did. Ladies with big hats. You know, and uh, it was just a different thing because when I went to Bible college, I had two ties. That's all I had, two neckties. And I didn't have a sport jacket. I didn't have a suit. And I was supposed to wear a suit to chapel on Wednesdays and then to church on Wednesday and church on Sunday. And you got in trouble if you didn't have the proper attire, but I didn't have anything. I had my 1963 Volkswagen, my guitar in the back with my clothes, what there were, and $300 to get going into Bible college in 1974 and I had to spend some of that because my fuel pump went out in Nashville and I had to get a new fuel pump from my Volkswagen. Max Brown will tell you the story about that. I managed to wrangle a fuel pump out of a guy who said we don't have one. <laughs> You'll find out how I did it. Ask Max. Anyway, uh, I went without any expectation. I thought the church and then we went to this auditorium, Chauncey Good Auditorium church that held 3,000 people. Wow. I was amazed at everything that was going on there, how big this was, the singing. Everything was great. And how they had once met in the building next door, the Phillips Chapel, kind of a dark uh, uh, brown uh, uh, building, a uh, brick building, beautiful inside chapel, big pipe organ. You would love to play it, Mrs. Cox. Oh, beautiful. And uh, we, we would go in there for recitals and things. And, and I remember that place and all the things that I heard that strengthened my Christian life as an 18-year-old, been saved three years in that, that church. Well, you know, we've been gone from there for, you know, 50 years, 50, 47 years, something like that. And it caught fire. It was actually uh, uh, arson. And they burned both those buildings down. We saw the pictures of that. And we just, you know, we just sort of, Tears in our eyes that are terrible. But you know, that that's not the church. The church is a holy temple of people. And all the people connected to that church, that school, the website came and all the comments that were there talking about how, what a great place that was and what it did for our lives and how it built us up spiritually. And we realized something, the church is still going. And all those people went out ministering all around the, the world, in the United States and the world, missionaries. Preachers, oh, servants, because that's what the church is. So nothing is going to stop God's church. Someone can burn down buildings. You can spend a billion dollars erecting a nice cathedral again, but you're not going to represent the church, true church of God through that. It's a holy temple. Now, the key word that I want you to look at with me now is found here in chapter 2. And verse 9, 
And I'm coming to a conclusion pretty quick here. So there's a divine confession that we need to make. Lord God, you brought me out of nothing. I was in Egypt spiritually and you took me out. You've given me in this place a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Old Testament man came. And every time during that feast of first fruits, they would come and everyone would have their basket with a representation of their of the crops that they made and they would present it before the Lord. They were also on that third year required to bring their tithe before the Lord and they were to confess to them, Lord, this is for the stranger. This is for the Levite. This is for the needy in the land. And I come and bring it and I bring it because you are the God who cared about me and took me out of Egypt and brought me to this great land. And the Christian should say, Lord, you're the one who brought me out of the darkness and the bondage of Satan and this world system. And you've raised me up and to put me in the spiritual places in Christ Jesus. And you've given me new life and you've given me an inheritance that will, will not pass away. It's reserved for me uh, by God. And through faith, I'm going to receive that. And the end of my salvation or the end of my faith, the salvation of my soul. And so, Lord, I stand before you, thanking you. And so Peter goes on and he says this, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation. And notice the next thing, a peculiar people. Peculiar. <laughs> I look out here and I see some peculiar people. Now, our culture defines that a little differently than what the, the Bible does. And I read to you part of that proclamation that the worshiper did before the Lord in his place. And he actually mentioned in, in Deuteronomy, the place that, that my name shall be. He was looking forward to the day the temple would be there and not just the tabernacle, but the temple would be there and there would be that place and it would be that permanent sort of thing. And you would understand this in a picture. And so they would come and they brought their offering. And he says, thou shalt say the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hallowed things. In other words, the things set apart, my tithe. That's not mine, that's God's. I set it apart for him. It's hallowed, it's holy to him. And I bring it to the, you, Lord. And I haven't, uh, it's for the, uh, for the stranger, for the Levite, the fatherless, the widow, according to all thy commandments which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed thy commandment, neither have I forgotten them. I have not eaten therefore in my mourning, neither have I taken away aught thereof for any unclean use, nor given aught thereof for the dead. For I have hearkened to the voice of Lord my God and have done according to all that thou hast commanded me. Look down from thy holy habitation from heaven and bless thy people Israel and the land which thou hast given us as thou swearest unto our fathers, a land that floweth with milk and honey. And the worshiper praised the Lord and gave his offering unto God. And then the priest said this, this day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep them and do them with all thine heart, with all thy soul. Thou hast avouched, that means you have proclaimed, the Lord this day to be thy God and to walk in his ways, to keep his statute and his commandments and his judgments, to hearken unto his voice. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people as he has promised thee. You, the God has been working way in the past time before you were even born about the issue of salvation. You accepted Jesus Christ. You came to know him. You became then his peculiar people people, his peculiar treasure. The Lord has avouched this. He has proclaimed this. He will not go back on it. That's why you can't lose the salvation that you have. Why? Because you are a peculiar people. You are separated. You are holy. And by the way, that's what this idea means. In Exodus 19, 5, when he started to give the commandments, he told the people, uh, he says, uh, now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. And that gives the sense of it. The idea behind this word peculiar in Hebrew is the idea to have something that is good, proper, shut up wealth. In other words, it's stored up. It's something you have that is valuable. You keep it close to you because it's significant. It's important. Deuteronomy 14.2 says the same thing. Thou art a holy people and the Lord thy God and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. God says, I have chosen you out as a royal priesthood. I've chosen you. I've separated you. That's what holy means. He says, you're mine and I'm yours. You're a chosen generation. 
Understand who you are in this holy temple that we are building with this divine confession that we are uh, uh, agreeing to, just as the worshiper agreed, God, you're the good God. You've given me all that I have. And so the New Testament word has the idea similar, and it's used in a couple places. In Titus 2.14, it's speaking about Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Huh, that's interesting. So you've been saved for a purpose. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're saved by grace. And if you're trying to work your way to heaven by doing something, quote, for the church, then you're never going to get there because the church has something to do for you. That has helped transform you. The body of believers will help transform you. And you're thinking that you'll be renewed in the spirit of your mind to understand what? That you are created to good works. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God saved you for a purpose. And that purpose is that you would glorify him with good works. You don't do good works to get to heaven. You do good works because you're going to heaven. Titus 2.14 says you're zealous of good works as the peculiar treasure of God. God says, you're special to me. You're my masterpiece. I'm putting you on display. And all that you do reflects on me. Phew. No pressure, right? Yeah, that's the big part of it here. So 1 Peter tells us, this is who you are. You're separated into God. So you're supposed to live like it. You're supposed to make a difference in this world. You're supposed to, if you have to, Peter goes on to say, suffer for Christ. That's fine. It's good. That's a good thing to do if you have to suffer for your faith. Go ahead and willingly accept that. Whatever that suffering might entail, do it. Because the message is significant. It cannot be set aside. It cannot be changed. And so God has avouched something. He's confessed something. That you are my peculiar treasure. That word in the, the Greek is an interesting word as well. It has the idea of something that you have obtained, an acquisition. It is something that is purchased. And oh, as we think about that, what does that mean for you, believer? For you are bought with a price. Know ye not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have in you, and ye are not your own? You're bought with a price. The precious blood of Christ. Oh, did we not read that in verse 18 of chapter 1? We'll look at it with me. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Peter likes that word. He likes that word precious. The word goes with peculiar. It is a treasure. It is an acquisition. If you acquire something that you really love, and you hang on to it, you keep it as a treasure. It might be put in a safe. It might be sitting in the garage, 1956 Corvette. I don't know. Whatever your dream is, you got something in there. It's sitting there and you're thinking, that's a treasure. I always thought of finding one of those in a barn somewhere. And the old farmer says, you know, preacher, I really can't use this anymore. Here, 50 bucks and it's yours. Okay, good deal. You say that's strange. No, that's like what getting saved is like. All of a sudden, it's presented to you and said for 50 bucks, it's free. Go and dig in that ground until you find that treasure and you find that treasure, you buy the whole field because it's worth it. All of a sudden, you realize how valuable you are to God because he planned all of this. <laughs> and so you're this peculiar pressure and you're to show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness. Verse 9 says, the precious blood of Christ saved you and now your responsibility is to call. Call on the world to know that I've been in darkness and now I'm in his marvelous light. Praise the Lord. <laughs> what a good thing the church is. What an essential thing it is. The world doesn't understand it. Let me ask you if you do. Do you understand how significant you are to the Lord? Separated unto Him? 
and do you understand how treacherous and trade how, how much of a traitor you are to go back to that old life when Christ has given you the new life the reason the Jews had to come forward and they had to make a proclamation before the priest for their offering to be accepted was that they might remember the Lord their, their God who brought them out and so we have to remember as well he brought us out of darkness into light He's given us this new life. He's given us this interdependence, one another, what the church is. So why? So the peculiar people, the strange people to the world, but not strange to God, precious to God. As he holds us close to him, he says, now be my witness. Share what you are. Not just what you say, share what you are in Christ with them so they can see me. That's what we need. Let's pray. Now, Father, would you help your people today? We thank you for your blessing. And Lord, as we say it so often, how grateful we are, yet we can never say it enough. We are mindful of how this world has a pull on us to keep us from understanding and keep us from rejoicing in what we are in you and how peculiar, special this acquisition that you have made by purchasing us with the blood of Christ is. May we never take it for granted. May we never overlook its significance. And today, if it's never been realized in a person's life, I pray that this will be the day, the moment they understand that Jesus Christ, God's eternal son, decreed to be the king over all his creation, is God and that they need to bow and receive him as Philippians 2 says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. And may that happen now. We pray you'll bless your people, strengthen them, bless their, their, their work of ministry for you, and help us in all things, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together. What do we need, my brother? 366. 366, final hymn. Would you stand please with me? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will, while I am waiting, yielded still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see.
the, uh, if you will, the, the Lord Jesus included the greatest commandments. He says there are two of them. And all the law and the prophets hang on them. The first one is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. And tonight I'd like to talk about that a little more deeply, about what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. And here's the, here's the real deal about that. As I thought about it, the only way you can love your neighbor as yourself is to be a forgiver like God is. And we're not real good at that. It doesn't matter about how much money you give them. Yes, they're cold and hungry, all that. If you're not a forgiver, you can't love your neighbor like you're supposed to. So we're not going to talk about that because of you. Good to have all our visitors here. Make sure members are welcome now. Thank you for being here with us today. Let's pray. Brother Joe, would you dismiss us, please? Father, well, again, we do thank you for the opportunity to have together in the virtual prison. We thank you for your provision for your father. Pray, Father, you'll continue to watch over this church and this body. Pray that you continue to give us guidance. We pray, Father, for our country. We pray, Father, that you keep each and every one of us. And we all want to say, please, come back to us tonight. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen.